Chapter 15 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape, Chapter 15 The Golden Ape. Haltax the Abarian shook himself. He had lost consciousness as every nerve ending in his body had screamed with pain. Did this have something to do with the warp, warping, Bram Forrest had mentioned? Haltax the Abarian did not know. But he did know that he was alive, as alive as anyone could be or had a right to be in the place of the dead. And he did know, gratefully, that the intense cold of the river of ice was gone. He wondered how long he had been unconscious. He blinked his eyes. A balmy, pink-tinted sky. A pink sun, not on the horizon, when indeed the sun might be pink, but overhead. On the horizon, Haltax blinked again and thought he was mad, a second sun, smaller, paler, the ghost of green in color. The royal barge was in ruins. It had piled up on some rocks. The beer of Jlomek, Prince of Nadia, had been thrown clear. He could see it on the bank, also in ruins. He stood up unsteadily, then waded through the shallow water in which he'd regained consciousness, over to the wreck of the royal barge. The fingers of his right hand were poised inches from the hilt of his whipsword. Slay Bram Forrest and the girl if the wreck hadn't already killed them? He shook his head. Bram Forrest knew more about this strange place, this world of the pink sun and the green sun, than he did. He climbed over the wreckage and finally came upon the two bodies. He went down on his knees beside them. They were covered with blood. They were broken, broken being the only word that could describe them. They had been crushed, perhaps by falling timber, perhaps by the beer of Jlomek as it hurtled over the side. There probably wasn't a bone in either of their bodies, at least a major bone, which had not been crushed. They were dead. With a craftiness which surprised even himself, Hultax remembered the dead Bram Forrest's words. It was the bracelet with the shining disc which gave Bram Forrest the power to appear and disappear at will, as Retok had described. Or, as Bram Forrest had put it, to journey between the worlds. Carefully, Hultax took the bracelet. It was miraculously intact, from the crushed, broken arm of Bram Forrest's corpse. He circled his own arm with it and felt, or imagined he felt, an instantaneous source of power surge through his body. Without looking back at the broken bodies of the man and woman who had found love and, finding it, died in each other's arms, he made his way from the river bank across a pleasant green meadow. Far in the distance he saw a dark blur which looked like a forest. It was many miles away, almost at the limit of vision. Yet, incredibly, it seemed to rush up at him. It was not merely that Hultax the Abarian walked with a warrior's long stride toward the forest. It was as if the forest rushed toward him. A different world. He remembered Bram Forrest's words vaguely. A warped world? Something like that? Naturally, Hultax was afraid. This was the place of the dead, wasn't it? But still, Bram Forrest's cool, if little understood scientific explanation quieted his fear. Besides, didn't he have the bracelet disc amulet? What could happen to him now? By Lanus, the golden ape, only two thousand seven hundred years old, quite young as golden apes went, saw the wreck of the barge from a great distance. He extended his vision through warp space and spotted the tiny figure of a man trudging away from the wreckage. Bylanus squinted and shifted his buttocks on the saddle. Bylanus was fifteen feet tall and weighed eight hundred pounds. The steed he rode, about twice the size of an earth elephant, looked like a blown-up cross between a Tarthian stad and an earth horse. Bylanus stared then sat up very straight in his stirrups. Something gleamed on the man's arm. Bylanus gaped. It was the bracelet of Portok's savior. 
Bylanus used his will to psychokinesize the man. The man, still apparently trudging along, sped toward him. Bylanus climbed down from his stallion and prepared to bow, all fifteen feet and eight hundred pounds of him, before the man. At first Hultax could think only of fleeing. Abruptly before him stood a monster stad and a man. No, not a man. A men-like figure, pelted with soft, smooth, lustrous, golden fur. The stad, the not-quite stad, was five times bigger than a stad had a right to be. The man, even as he unexpectedly bent before Hultax, was almost three times Hultax's height. Man? No, not a man. Hultax rooted with fear to the spot, unable to run, opened his mouth to cry out. But his vocal cords were paralyzed. This was no man. It was the golden ape of legend. The golden ape of the place of the dead. Poor talk's savior, said the golden ape quite distinctly. Then he pointed a forefinger, almost the size of Hultak's forearm, at the bracelet Hultax wore. Hultax took a deep breath and could feel the strength returning to his legs. Like all military officers, he was an opportunist. He had to be, for in battle one had to seize upon opportunity as soon as it appeared, if one were to win at all. Hultax said, his voice surprisingly steady, "'You may rise.' The ape did so. The stallion pawed the ground, and great clods flew. Hultax was trembling, but the ape, speaking in Hultax's own language, in the language of all Tarth, said, "'Are you really from Portox? It seems like only yesterday he was here, although, of course, your people and mine measure time differently.' "'I am from Portox,' Hultax said. He wished he could keep his knees from trembling. Portok's savior said that one day a man would come to ask us for help, even as Portox helped us in our time of troubles, the ape proclaimed. Yes, Hultax muttered. What kind of help do you wish? Hultax stared, saying nothing. He did not know what to say. He lacked the imagination to make something up. Somehow he knew it was terribly important. He knew, without knowing how he knew, that his life might depend on his answer. Well? the golden ape asked gently. I... that is... the ape's eyes narrowed as he looked down at Hultax. You are from Portox. Yes, yes, of course. I see you have the bracelet. Yes, here is the bracelet. And the cloak of Portox? demanded the ape. The cloak Portox foretold you would wear? I... I lost the cloak in my journey, lied Hultax, not knowing about any cloak. There, he thought, that ought to satisfy him. But the ape said, There was no cloak. No cloak? No cloak? I made that up to test you. You are not from Portox. The stallion pawed the ground and looked up and then down at Hultax, snorting. Hultax, trembling, wished he could melt into the ground. Still, Hultax said, shaking, I am from Portox. You tried to trick me. You... We shall see, the ape said, still pleasantly. Come. The ground rolled, or so it seemed to Hultax. The forest loomed ahead of him, then trees were all around him, then they stood on a rolling plain again. "'Where did you take me?' The ape smiled. He seemed quite human, despite his size, despite his fur. The stallion pawed the ground impatiently. "'Behold,' said the ape. Something on the fringe of the forest screamed. It was an awful sound, and it made the hackle stand upright on Hultax's bull-neck. He drew his whip-sword and faced the forest. "'Well, man,' chided the golden ape, "'and do you need a weapon? Portox told us we would know his man because his man, unarmed, 
would be able to conquer the wild boar of the Cranuian wood. And you? The screaming came again. Terrified, Haltax did not fling his weapon aside. Wild boar? What wild boar? Time enough later to convince the ape. The boar emerged. It was almost as big as a man and covered with dirty gray hair. Its tusks were two feet long. The stallion whinnied but remained perfectly still. The golden ape waited and watched. The boar charged. Haltax's right arm blurred and the mobile blade of the whipsword whizzed through air and struck the boar's meaty shoulder. The boar screamed and came on. It was, Haltax realized in despair, only a superficial wound. The boar came on, bleeding, furious. He tried to lunge aside. He yanked at the whipsword, and it came loose, making him lose his balance. The boar reached him, screaming. Never slackening its pace, the boar gored him and wheeled about, clods flying, to gore again. Haltax's voice bubbled in his throat. The boar was on him again, its tusks sharp as razors. Finally, it stood clear, nervously eyeing Bylanus and the stallion. Then it turned and slowly, with great dignity, retreated into the Cranuian wood, which was its home. The man Bylanus saw at a glance was dead. As an impostor, he had deserved to die. Bylanus quickly dug a shallow grave with a large, sharp-edged stone and rolled the body in. As he did so, he noticed that the bracelet, the bracelet of Portok's savior, or more probably, a copy of that bracelet intended to trick him, had been battered, punctured, and broken by the boar. Even if it had been the real bracelet, the amazing steel-silver disc of Portok's savior, it would now be useless. Sighing, Bylanus buried it with Haltax's body. Bylanus mounted his steed and galloped toward the river. He could have psychokinesized himself there, but the day was brilliant and clear, and he was in no great hurry. At last he reached the wreck of the royal barge of Nadia. He did not pause to examine Jlomek's beer. He had seen such funerary devices before. Something in the wreck itself confused him. There was a man. There was a woman. That fit the ritual. Two servants to accompany dead royalty on its way. This was the custom of the Nadians. But the man. On the man's crushed arm, the arm completely covered with blood, was a mark. It was as if something, say a band of metal, had protected the arm at one point. For circling the upper arm was a band of skin not bloody like the rest, wide in the shape of a disc, then narrow all around. The bracelet of Portok's savior, thought Bylanus. Had this dead man worn it? Had the impostor, now slain by the wild boar, taken it from him? Oh, Portok's savior, Portok's savior, how long dead? Am I too late? Is it too late for this man, your heir? As gently as he could, the huge Bylanus lifted the two bodies and put them in his saddlebags. He faced the Cranuian wood astride. The stallion held its head up, alert, ready. They psychokinesthized. And disappeared in a twinkling with Bram Forrest and Ilya, both of whom were dead. End of chapter 15